Two villages within walking distance of one another on a bleak and unforgiving stretch of Britain's east coast. One Walcott saved by a multinational corporation. Oh, it's helped us an awful lot. And we do get other benefits from the terminal because they appreciate that we just have the nuisance of their lorries and everything up and down all the time. Another, Haysborough, left to the elements. It's not a case of saying it can't be afforded. You can't afford not to unless we're just going to say bye bye by, by UK. You know, is that what we're going to do? Two British communities just a few miles apart and two very different strategies for dealing with this. And one of them says it's been left high and dry, so to speak. Welcome to Beyond Borders. Left to sink rather than high and dry, say those in Haysborough, at the current rate of erosion, it is possible that the whole of the village will be claimed by the sea within 80 years. The Saxon church, the ancient burial ground, the 17th century inn. The lighthouse, which was built in 1790, had a twin that's gone, submerged. How long before this one goes? Well, in theory, what they're saying is this lighthouse could turn into an island because the water should come round both sides of it. And that's the latest prediction. Bryony Nearop Redding saw her last home in Haysborough disappear over the edge in 2013. I'm very bitter about it, actually. Um, and not only had we had proper defences in, if they'd have left the old defences there instead of uh, tidying up the beach, um, my house would still be there because when I moved in I had about 25 years there because the cliff was only receding slowly because there were, there was, um, in the sea there were rocks there were the old revetments which, although a lot of the wood had gone, they were breaking the force of the waves. And then there was a pile of metal um, pipes filled with concrete. Very, very ugly, but it did actually work. Bryony has moved about 50 metres and won't leave, even though the authorities would like her to be away from the coast. There was something called the Pathfinder Scheme, which offered residents 40% of the value of their homes if they moved to a safer place. She turned that offer down. We've got to think about our children's children's children now. And with these current plans of managed retreat and adaptation and rolling back, all that is saying is we're going to just abandon our country to the sea and we're just going to retreat. And it's not very British retreating in the first place, which is one thing that annoys me. You know, we've beaten off or, or sorted out loads of invasions of one kind or another. And we did manage to keep coastal erosion under control while sea defences were being built. It's this abandonment which gets up my nose. Next door is Nicola Bayliss, the two homes still dangerously close to the edge. And she's planning to move, along with her collection of caged birds. They might be able to relocate me, um, so that'll probably be council accommodation. Um, but but no this is worth quite a lot, money. was worth quite yeah, a lot. Yeah, if it was in another location, I've been told two years ago when I had it evaluated, it would be worth 375,000, but where it is, it's 125. But who would buy? So that's a third of what you think yeah. its market value would be yeah. if it weren't for this problem. Exactly. So um, <coughs> you're going to lose a lot of money, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. So um, you know, this is my home, but I've also got a holiday let in the village. I can move there if I wanted to, um, but this was my parents' home originally. Um, so, But that's just life, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Can't do anything about it. No. The local bin man wanted to buy a house but couldn't get a mortgage. We are in the beach car park next to a large drop. I think they've got a plan to move the car park into the next field at some stage. 
And the extraordinary thing is, I mean, just look at it, it's, it's eating in yeah. day by day. And this isn't even a rough day, no, is it? No, this I mean, isn't a rough crikey. day. And if we swing cool. around, come over here, Mark. If we swing around and take a look at this, uh, you know, it's, it's relatively calm, this is isn't calm, it? yep. And actually, only two weeks ago, the bottom of the ramp got washed away. Just we had a spring tide, the bottom of the ramp was washed away. It was shut for about a week. Come with me over here. <laughs> Because I want to look at this. This is what it used to be like. I don't know how many years ago, but we well, are. This actually, I mean, this. Where are we now? We're, yeah. We're probably just there, aren't we? Yeah. So yeah. So. Oh, look at that. And there used to be a whole road here with houses all up here. This was the house. In fact, that's the house that they've taken down where the emergency sign is. That was taken down about a month ago. This, and I think the cliff now probably is like that. Rob Goodliff is coastal manager for the local council. We can protect some locations, um, but some locations we can't protect anymore. Um, the reasons are, for, for things to be protected, um, we have to be technically able to do it, so that's one thing. Um, we have to be able to afford to do it, and that's a real, real challenge, because sea defences are extremely expensive. And it has to also be environmentally acceptable to do it. So it's not going to have a bigger impact on the wider coastline and various other, other things along the coastline. Are you saying, therefore, that it's not worth the money? No, it's not, it's not, it's not us saying it, it's not worth the money. It's about the government prioritising where it spends, spends money and how it spends money. Well, that sounds like the government doesn't think it's worth spending the money. But, it, but, it's, but it's also about the, about, about the wider picture as well. So in some locations, and I'm not saying this one, in some locations, you could have lots and lots of money if it was available. It's unlikely to be, um, but you still may not be able to do anything because it might not be technically viable. You might not be able to design something which is going to work. Well, how come they can do that up, up the coast where, where Shell, the big company Shell, has been able to protect that area? How come? The one up the coast is predominantly private funding from the gas terminal. Most of it didn't come from government. So two thirds of that funding came from, um, from private funding. If that private funding hadn't come forward, that scheme would not have happened and those communities wouldn't have been protected either. Absolutely, so, absolutely. So here, yes or no, it could be done here if the money was available. So here you'd have to do an environmental assessment on whether it could be done. You'd have to look at whether technically it would work or not. If, if you had 20 to 40 million pounds possibly, you, know, you could extend your or, or, or you could have extended that scheme, but the funding wasn't there to do that sort of, sort of work okay. for, the, for that area. Do me a favour and answer the question. If the money was available, it could possibly be done here. If we had funding, large amounts of funding, and it could be prioritised to this location rather than somewhere else, you could look and see how you could slow erosion rates down in this location. And then there's Walcott, which is a short drive or even shorter walk up the coast, and is neighbour to Shell, which from its Bacton plant here delivers about one third of the UK's entire gas supply. It is a sensitive site, as we discovered. You've been seen around there filming. Okay. I appreciate from what you're saying, you're doing it for legitimate reasons, but oh, we yeah, need yeah. to just make sure that's of all course. in order and everything. I mean, we just thought, you know, so. it's a public road, we'll walk down with yeah, the I'm camera. Not, I'm, I'm, and I'm not suggesting you have done anything wrong. Okay, okay, it's okay. just more just to make sure Absolutely, that everything's yeah, all in yeah. order and everything like that. Absolutely. And, all right. Shell delivered a local miracle in 2019, paying two thirds of the $25 million cost of building a new sandbank off the coast at Walcott designed to absorb the force of the waves after the village had been flooded countless times. The government's environment agency gave less than a quarter of the cost. Six weeks was all it took to dredge up 1.8 million cubic metres of sand and dump it at Walcott. A new beach and defences to last maybe 15 years had arrived. Shell and the UK's gas interests were safe for now, and Walcott was that little bit more protected, even if sitting in my car, it appeared a fight that only nature would eventually win. Well, you can feel the car being buffeted by these winds up to 45, 50 miles an hour. Here's the seawall. This is in Walcott. And yeah, of course it's stopping the the full force of the waves going over the road, but 
you can see how powerful it is and at the highest of tides this would easily be swamped as it was in the past but perhaps that sandscaping really does make a difference Walcott has it Haysborough doesn't it's rough out there once they, they did all the sandscaping, it looked really good. You know, we didn't see the breakers and it was like, oh, wow, big beach. Now, it seems to be the, the same. To me, it seems the same again as it was. I know that the, the people from the cafe think it still worked because um, the sea hasn't come over the wall. But um, I don't know. When I was driving along just now, I saw that the whole pavement is wet. So the, the sea has come over the wall, I don't know. Since they did the seascaping, we haven't seen the, the water coming over the wall like it used to. Although we've just been talking this morning and saying it's hitting the wall this morning, the sea when it comes in, and it, it vibrates in the house and everything. When the storm was here, 2013, I notice you've put all the electrical bits yes. right, right up high, all the plugs, everything like that. Yeah. How high up in here did it come? Um, I think it was kind of waist height. From here. So up to here? I believe so, yeah. We weren't here at the time. Um, but the doors came in, and obviously uh, uh, followed by a deluge. Come um, with me over here. Yeah. We're just going to have a look at... Have a look at those palings outside there, all that wood that you've put in. Yes. What does that do? The water um, it does, it? comes over with a, a, a deal of force. It just saves the impact in the building. Pauline Porter remembers the day the dredger arrived with the sand for the sea defences. And oh, I can't, can't describe the elation when that ship came in because we'd had some near misses with high tides and things and we just keeping our fingers crossed that we got through it's been to six years, August. Six years since this terrible yeah. storm, hasn't it? Um, we were just keeping our fingers yeah. crossed that we'd get through to Sandscape and then the ship came and there were tears of joy, literally tears of joy. And for the weeks that they were here, the whole of the, <laughs> whole of the beach was lined with people, obviously off the beach, but as near as we could get. Um, vantage points and people would go for the whole day, take sandwiches, bottles of wine. Everybody was there all the time watching this because it was something Can to you see. Say it's theater. It's theater. It was something to see. It was quite amazing to watch. It was paid for mostly by Shell. Well, not just Shell because there are more. There were four term, four companies up well, at the terminal the then. Business, the gas terminal, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, because they lost a substantial amount of cliff and obviously they're of national importance so they had to do something to protect themselves people and down the coast where we've been in Haysborough say they're of national importance as well and they've got nothing well they are of national importance in uh, it's a site of scientific interest the footsteps were found there there's all sorts of things there's evidence of man being there thousands of years yeah. ago if not millions but they say they're being ignored do you think um, they're just whinging they aren't being ignored, I don't believe. In the past, they have had a scheme. Um, but the scheme was basically get off the cliff, move yes, inland. Yes, yes, it was. It, it wasn't it we're was. going to save the cliff or no, save the beach, no, as they've done here. No. Um, I think the trouble is it would cost a heck of a lot of money to save all of us. The iniquities between Haysborough and Walcott are pushed away by some with the suggestion that Haysborough and the coast beyond it will get part of the new defences in years to come as sand is washed south. But it's not just Haysborough that's had little help. Beyond Backton and Walcott to the north is Trimmingham and it's here that we meet Angie, a local councillor who had the coastal portfolio until she was sacked for voting against a rise in council tax. And I don't want you to go too close how, either. How close can we get? Well, there could be a slight overhang. All right, well, let's not get too I close. Yeah. That the is what fell down. So the bit of land we can see down yes. here was once up here. And here, and it went, the whole lot just went overnight in one bang, big slump. 
And was, and that, you can was, the, see... was the pub still here at that no. point? So no, no, no. Gone? That had gone. But you can see the water down there. Yeah. And really... The... But this wasn't the sea that did this. It, no. It was just rainwater. Yeah, it's... Just became and this is the... sodden. This... And just... Bang. this is what happens along this coast. She takes us to meet Martin Collingham, who moved out of Cliff House to a smaller home next door because of mobility issues. He believes that underpinning the chalk that his home sits on means it is in no danger. So you're just going to stay here? As long as I can. Is it going to go into the sea? No. That was underpinned on chalk by uh, a firm in Norwich. And it's, it's underpinned into the chalk and that won't go in. That'll, it, that'll be there before we, uh, we go. Solid, but for how long? This whole coastline is moving inland. We head to Hemsby, south of Haysborough. It is a vast holiday area with amusements, cafes and a beautiful beach, which when we visited was out of bounds. It's been closed on the advice of the lifeboat helmsman, Chris, who's with us here. And apparently it's only going to get worse. The wind and the rain and the waves coming in. It's not going to be opened up anytime soon. There's a there's calculations done by central government, and if we don't if we don't qualify, we don't qualify. I mean, there was a big sort of um, there was a big um, interview done on local radio this week, where a government official was saying about another not Hemsby, but another area related to Hemsby that uh, they didn't qualify for any funding from the government. The government has set aside a significant amount of money, um, but the, uh, the, the they didn't qualify. Um, I don't know the exact algorithm they use, but I do know that it's related to the number of dwellings. And if the dwellings number is low, then that's lower down the peck in order for sea defences. So it's tough luck for them, really. Pretty much. But then there is other, the other side of the coin is, um, what is the return on investment? And so for Hemsby and the local area, the return on investment is well over 80 million a year. The tourist industry brings to this area about 80 million in revenue each year. Um, so a proportion of that obviously funds the, the, the government through taxes, etc. If we don't have a beach, we don't have a tourist industry, that 80 million stops. So that in itself justifies having some, some degree of defence. I think defences could cost, I mean they talk about just this area here, just the Hemsley Gap, a short term solution is about 250,000. But that 250,000 would, would protect an 80 million income for a short period of time. The main project might take cost as much as, you know, 15, 20 million, but it's saving 80 million in revenue. So for me, it makes economic sense. These holiday chalets are too close. The occupants in too much danger in the storm that follows. And the buildings become the latest casualties when it's calm enough for the demolition company to move in. All of which presents problems for safety beyond the homes. This sheer drop was recently a gentle slope down which the lifeboat was launched. Well, you can see how steep this is sheer, actually. I'm six foot and this is, what, two feet taller than me. So an eight foot drop, absolutely straight down. And the lifeboat would normally go out through this gap. They'd tow it down here and it would just come straight down on a slope. It's absolutely impossible now. And the lifeboat, well, it would go out maybe 50 times a year. It can't go out at all at the moment. Back in Haysborough, we talked to local councillor Clive Stockton, who owns the 16th century village inn. He was told his pub had 300 years left when he bought it 30 years ago. He's now having to revise that estimate. At that time, uh, the policy for this coast was hold the line, and the survey gave us a life of 300 years. Now it's what? 20, if we're lucky. <laughs> How come? Well, because government changed its position. It went from hold the line to no active intervention, to managed retreat, and now it's managed realignment. So it's a change in government policy. Our defences from the late 50s, early 60s have gone, they've collapsed, past their design life, and now we are on an undefended piece of coast. 
Um, and about to suffer the consequences. And they will be what? Total loss of the place. Total loss of everything we own. It's our home, it's our business. If this pub was anywhere else other than in the dangerous position it's in, it would be worth a great deal of money. Probably close to a million. But as it is, it's virtually unsaleable. Its only value is in what we can turn over in the next however many years we can be in business. Um, you knew that the sea was coming in. You knew that the land was falling away. Would it have been wiser not to believe somebody when they said you've got a couple of hundred years? Well, you say believe somebody. It was the shoreline management plan, which is the government's own document. The sleet is horizontal, the winds 80 kilometers an hour, and waves hammer the coastline and chip away the only protection these homes have. When we meet the local MP, Duncan Baker, at the top of Haysborough Lighthouse. If Shell can put in that money and save Walcott to some extent, for its own ends, if you like, because it has to have the gas plant there, why can't the government put the money in here, somewhere like Haysborough, do the same yeah. and save those houses. Well, Just can't afford it, not we are, it? We are an island nation. I don't think we can probably practically build up our beaches around the entire stretches of the United Kingdom and practically use taxpayers' money to do that to save every inch of our coastline. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. You've got to be practical, you've got to be sensible, you've got to help the people who are most at risk and most vulnerable, and that's what we're doing with that CTAP money. Is there are metrics around what you do with the investment programme and, and with that strategy, and that's why the money that we've been given We'll look at how we help these communities. Now, is it going to be that we're going to replace sea defences? Is it that we're going to build another beach? Probably not, because recognising that actually, is that viable? Is it economically viable? Is it even going to do the job? And that's a big issue as well, because, you know, looking at today, will anything be able to uh, counteract what the sea is doing? The lighthouse didn't help when one of Admiral Nelson's fighting ships, the HMS Invincible, ran aground on Haysborough Sands in 1801. 400 people on board died. We're standing on a grave. I feel a bit wrong about that. but yeah. 119 bodies were eventually recovered and are buried at Haysborough's St Mary's Church. Yeah, well... At least they've remembered, hey? It's the, exactly, it's there for a reason. When you think it was almost 200 years before their body was discovered. Amazing. It is amazing. Now, the work you would say, the sea's always going to win, as it did with these poor souls. So is everything they're trying to do, with any kind of defences, pointless? No. Uh, this, I mean, this whole subject is full of irony. Of course it isn't pointless, because if you use hard defences, you can slow the erosion down to a much, much more manageable level. So you don't let it run rampage. The problem comes is if you use hard defences in one area, you create other problems further down drift. So it will probably erode faster where there are no defences than it would have done had you not put it... For example... You're channeling the force elsewhere. Yeah, and you're, you're concentrating the power in one area. Is it, now, it's OK if you can defend the whole coast because you're creating an equilibrium, an unnatural equilibrium, but an equilibrium nevertheless. What do you think here should be done? You say you can't stop it. Well, but, So what should be done? You, do you, you want everybody to move away from the sea? Well, I personally, for many years, I've been advocating um, adaptation, uh, rollback. In other words, in, in perfectly simple terms, as they drop off the front, you rebuild landward. But, th but that might never stop. You might have to oh, end up absolutely. further and further and further inland. But that's nature. We are an island nation. We can't change that. On the naval tombstone in the graveyard, and the sea gave up the dead that were in it.
At the current rate of land loss, it may not be long before it reclaims them. How quickly this can happen. One day this was farmland, the next morning, well, you can see just one enormous hole. But what makes this really interesting is that it wasn't the sea that caused the slip, it was heavy rain on top of unstable sand. And there's not much you can do to defend against that. The questions then for those in charge of protecting Britain's vanishing coastline. What is it possible to save? What should we prioritise? And who or where comes top of the list? Finding answers to those questions becomes more important by the day.